Okay, can, can you guys hear me okay? Um, do, uh, do I need to do anything, Kelly, with the computer? Like streaming or anything? Like we're all, we good? Go for it. Okay, thank you guys so much for coming to my talk today. I've had a really great visit so far. I'm looking forward to meeting with more people um, this afternoon. I think we're going for a beer at around 4.30 over at the pub, so hopefully some of you guys can make it over there. Um, I, Ken said he would buy. Just... <laughs> usual, yeah. Um, so uh, there are a lot of different factors that can affect um, ecological communities, and I've listed a few of these here, biotic things like competition and predation, and abiotic things like nutrients availability or, or stress and, and human impacts. And so one of the things that we're trying to do in, in my lab um, is, is to uh, sort of understand how these things um, interact to affect communities, and we really um, focus um, heavily on oysters, and we do that because oysters are um, fairly easy to, to manipulate. You can bring them into the lab and build reefs and this kind of thing, um, but also they're, they're just incredibly important, and I don't need to spend a lot of time uh, in this crowd sort of belaboring this point, but it, as you well know, they provide habitat, they're, um, they filter the water for us, they provide shoreline protection, um, and uh, they're delicious, right, and as I had a sandwich for lunch, and so um, they're one of the largest commercial fisheries uh, in the Gulf, and I think 10th or 12th largest in the country. So there's, you know, both an ecological and an, an economic interest in studying them. Um, and, and so what I'm really going to do today is, is talk about several different kinds of studies that we've done to try to fill in some of these gaps to understand, you know, how sort of predation and, and abiotic factors and, and even genetic diversity sort of interact to affect the reef, how that impacts potentially biodiversity on the reef um, and how these, these factors work together. And, and some things are, are pretty clear um, and, and some um, not so much. And what's really interesting, I think, is that a lot of um, these kinds of interactions are mediated um, through chemical signals, um, especially those involving predator, prey, and recruitment, which I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and so um, as a chemical ecologist, of course, I'm not really interested in and how these, um, these processor, or processes are driven through chemical signals. So um, I was going to call this talk Ecological Pulp Fiction, um, because if you've seen Pulp Fiction, it's got a lot of little vignettes that sort of feed together to tell this bigger story. And that's really kind of what I'm going for today. Um, and I took the slide out because my wife said that I was dating myself because this movie is 20 years old and none of these kids would ever have heard of it because they all were born after that. Um, and then I was at dinner last night, and they were like, oh, no, this is a classic movie. We've all seen it. So um, I, I put this slide in, but, but that's, a, that's the general idea. So um, I want to talk a lot about uh, predator-prey interactions. Um, and, uh, and, and most of the predator-prey interactions in marine systems are, are chemically mediated. And what I mean by that is, you know, for example, in this situation, this clam is feeding. It's giving off. Uh, primary metabolites. Um, the, the blue crab here is smelling no metabolites. He detects dinner. He finds the clam. Um, also, the clam then detects the crab, reacts to that crab, um, clams up to avoid being dinner. There's just tons and tons of examples of this, of um, chemically mediated um, predator-prey interactions in the ocean. Uh, for purposes of, of, um, of uh, uh, or from a praise perspective, though, um, these sorts of um, situations where you need to detect and avoid predators are costly. And so I, I've put this sort of hypothetical graph up here. And so when predation is low, um, they're devoting a lot of energy toward reproduction and growth and not much to defense. And when predation pressure is higher, they're in risky habitats. They devote you know, more energy toward defense, and then they sacrifice growth and reproduction to do that. And this probably comes as no surprise to you that predator avoidance behaviors are costly to prey, um, so they need um, a reasonable amount of information to be able to make the best decisions that they can to maximize their growth and reproduction and, and minimize those costs, but then to employ um, predator avoidance strategies when necessary. So um, there are a number of things that can influence um, perception uh, and response to chemical signals, and these are things like the concentration of the chemical cue, um, the duration that, that that animal is exposed to that chemical cue, 
um, the type of cue that it is, as well as the delivery of that cue. So water flow can have a big effect on the way things are perceived. And although I've, I've done a lot of work on cue delivery, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about that much today. I'm really going to focus um, much more on these, um, on these first three. So um, in 2012, we, we published a paper, and um, we found that in the field when we, we grew oysters in the presence of mud crabs, they tended to grow a heavier shell and produce less soft tissue. And um, this sort of followed up with some work that Roger Newell's group had done, um, as well as some work uh, finding similar patterns with um, oyster drills that, that Bob Whitlatch's group has done as well. And so the idea here is that when oysters are threatened by predators, they build a heavier shell that presumably makes it harder for, for crabs and things to crush them and eat them. Um, and then they grow less soft tissue, which um, likely lowers their fecundity. So we, we had observed this a number of times, but we, what we really wanted to do um, was, was do an experiment to sort of for sure show that this was a response to a predator chemical cue, um, and also to assess any potential benefits that, that this morphological change would have. In other words, we knew that they were growing a thicker shell, we knew they were producing less soft tissue, um, but did it actually work um, against predators? So um, this was some work that was started by uh, uh, Elizabeth Robinson and Jessica Lott, who are pictured here. Um, so we set up um, a musicosm experiment at one of the labs and, and what we did, um, these are um, larval oysters that we got from Scott Vicard right here at Dolphin Island, who shipped them to us. And we settled them onto shells and we grew them in these musicosms over the summer. Um, and we exposed these oysters to either uh, a single blue crab or three uh, mud crabs, um, or no predator controls, and then compared their morphology. Um, we, we elected to do the three mud crabs for one blue crab because mud crabs are generally about three times or more, more abundant on the reef, um, and because three big mud crabs had about the same biomass as a single blue crab in our study. So we tried to control a little bit for um, concentration. So we grew the oysters up for 10 weeks, and then afterwards we, we um, measured their diameter. Okay, um, we, we took the, some of them off and we weighed them. Uh, and then we also um, used this device here um, a f called a force transducer or a penetrometer and essentially you just apply pressure to the, to the oyster shell until it breaks. And this records the maximum amount of force that you need to do that. Okay, so it's sort of a reasonable approximation for, um, you know, like a crab claw, how much force they would need to break an oyster open. Um, the other thing we did um, was feeding assays. And so we took oysters that were grown in the presence of either blue crabs or mud crabs or controls, and we put these oysters into, a, into this small Tupperware and tank with one large... Atlantic mud crab and just let it feed on these things for a couple of uh, couple of days and then that way we could see you know if this induced change actually had some sort of benefit. Um, this is uh, shell diameter and what we found is that in predator treatments the oysters tend to grow uh, sort of broader and flatter okay and that that response was stronger to blue crabs than to uh, than to mud crabs or controls. Um, for shell weight, this was not exactly what we saw in the field. We did see a heavier shell in response to blue crabs, um, but not to mud crabs. As you can see here, mud crabs weren't statistically different than controls, um, but blue crabs were. But what was interesting is when we looked at that shell hardness measure, how much force it took to crush the shell, um, both blue crabs and mud crabs, significantly more force was required to crush these oysters than we saw in the control treatments. So. This led us to think that, that even though the, the shell weights weren't different, the oysters are doing something morphologically to make the shell stronger. Okay, And so some current work right now we're doing is trying to figure out what in the world that is. But regardless, in both blue crab and mud crab oysters that were induced in those treatments had significantly higher survival than those in control treatments. And so whatever they're doing to make that shell stronger, it's an effective um, predator deterrent. Okay, so it's costly to them, but it works. So just to reiterate for a second, oysters do have phenotypic plasticity. It does increase survival. And not only do they detect predatory threats, but it seems that they can distinguish between them. Okay, so they respond to blue crabs and mud crabs differently. Um, this may be because of a difference in cue concentration um, or a difference in um, 
the type of key that they're detecting. So this is Avery Scher. Um, Avery is uh, taking her candidacy exams, actually starting today. Um, and she came into the lab two years ago, and she's been really interested in following up on this, um, on this research with oyster plasticity. And one of the first things that, that, that we, we thought of is that, you know, you've got predators like blue crabs that are really more transient. You know, they don't really live on the oyster reef. They move onto the oyster reef, they forage, they leave the oyster reef and go somewhere else and move around. As compared to something like a mud crab that lives on the oyster reef all the time. So maybe we're sort of biasing that first experiment a little bit by taking a predator that shouldn't really be there all the time and exposing the oysters to it all the time. So Avery's first experiment, um, again, we did a similar mesocosm study. We got these oysters, settled them, grew them up in the presence of blue crabs. Um, and then we, we just simply varied the amount of time they were exposed. In some treatments, they were exposed constantly. In some, it was uh, a couple of hours a week. In some, it was one full day a week. So it was a way to look at um, sort of the duration of exposure. Um, and what she found was that in all the treatments, they actually grew a heavier shell compared to controls. Okay, But in the sort of intermediate treatments, the crushing force wasn't significantly different, only in the constant treatments. And so w we interpreted that to mean that, that there's sort of some kind of intermediate response going on here, and that that's leading up to, um, to, to in other words, they're, they're starting the response here and then finishing it here, right? And so the longer they're exposed, the stronger that response becomes, which probably reflects that level of risk. So... I think we've, we've shown that the duration of exposure is probably important. So then um, we wanted to look at key source. And if you think about a prey organism, it can detect a predatory threat based on detecting the predator itself or perhaps detecting um, injury or stress from a conspecific that the predator is eating. Okay, so in the oyster's case, it could probably detect, it clearly detects the blue crab Maybe it also would detect an injured oyster, right? Is a is a, um, a signal that that um, predation is going on in that area. And so, we felt like that the cue from the predator should really be a a more um, a more honest or more accurate cue of predation risk. There's lots of reasons that oysters could die that isn't related to predators, right? And so the injured oyster cue could be a predator or it could be something else. So we felt like the cues to um, injured uh, to crabs would be greater than injured oysters. But we also know that blue crabs are generalist predators and they eat lots of different things, including things like clams that happen to live on oyster reefs. And so maybe not only can oysters detect injured oysters, maybe they can detect other injured prey. Um, but we would think that they would be more in tune with their own species of injury than something else. And so the working hypothesis was to expose them to these different cues, including injured conspecifics and heterospecifics. And so in this treatment, it, it's again, similar mesocosm study um, controls. We've got either crushed oysters or crushed clams. And these are a blue crab that had been starved, one that had been reared on oysters, or one that had been um, fed clams prior to the experiment. And in this study, we didn't want to crush a clam and leave it or crush an oyster and leave it in the tank for a week. So what we ended up doing was we had a, a tank, a 20 liter tank, and we would put the blue crabs or we'd crush the oysters in there and leave them in there for an hour and then we would take that water out and add it to the oyster tank. Okay, so in this um, study they're only getting um, chemical cues from these oysters, or from the predator cues. Um, if we look at shell weight, in response to all the different treatments, whether it was to blue crabs or to injured clams, which I was really surprised to see, or to injured oysters, they grow heavier shells. And in response to uh, all these things, they grow a shell that takes more force to crush and break. Okay? But what's really surprising to us is that the crab that was eating oysters was um, sort of less responded to, even though it wasn't significantly different than the one that had fed clams, right? Which was a little puzzling. And we got to thinking about this, and I asked Avery, I said, well, did you do anything, like, did you do anything different? And she said, well, the clams are alive in the lab, and we break them open, and we feed, the, we feed it to the crab right then. 
The oysters, I shuck them in the field. We bring back the tissue in a cooler, and then I feed it to them the next day. So we thought maybe that whatever's in the oyster that triggers the response decays over time, and what we need to do is shuck the oyster in the lab and do it right then. So we repeated this experiment this summer with just the predator cues, and, ta-da, you know, so not only do oysters, this isn't, they're pretty smart for a little snot ball, right? I mean, um, so these oysters, they, they respond more to crabs that are eating oysters, but only when those oysters are freshly eaten or consumed. And so if crabs are scavenging, they, they're no more you know, dangerous than a starved crab. They still respond to them, um, but more in tune with ones that have been eating um, fresh oysters. So, all right, thus far in the talk, um, I've covered uh, injured con and header specifics and how uh, these things affected uh, oyster morphology. We know that exposure type and cue is important. Um, and, and again, interestingly, um, the time since last feeding can affect the responses of these, of these crabs. So. Okay, so I want to shift gears a little bit from this morphology and talk more about some of the, the bigger community-wide studies that, that we've been doing. Um, and I've, I'm just showing sort of this classic um, food chain diagram. I got this out of a general bio textbook. And, and just to sort of remind people of, of the idea of a, of a trophic cascade. So, you know, wolves are reintroduced into Yellowstone National Park. Um, it leads to an increase in uh, diversity and abundance of plants in the meadows. And that's because wolves prey on, on elk. Um, and also because elk are scared of wolves and they won't come out and forage in the open. Okay, so the, the trophic cascade is driven both by predation and also by fear. And there's been just, I mean, tons and tons and tons and tons of studies on trophic cascades and all sorts of systems. This is clearly established. Um, the problem is most of the systems where these um, kinds of studies are done and they tend to work tend to be very linear, or they tend to be done in a lab where they're made to be very linear. And food webs tend to look more like this than like that. Okay. This is one I downloaded off Google from a part of Chesapeake Bay. Okay, so um, one of the things we wanted to do on oyster reefs was figure out if trophic, you know, if these top-down forces are important, um, and what do they do, and, and what matters. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of different sort of top predators on oyster reefs, and I've pictured a red drum, a, a sheep's head, and a blue crab. There's certainly many others, sea trout, and, and I mean, just tons and tons of things that can go on and on. Um, what makes the oyster system perhaps even more complicated is not only do you have this big suite of, of predators, and I could have put a bunch of intermediate things in here too. I just put this crab, but um, a lot of the top predators like blue crabs and sheep's head eat the oysters too. Okay, so you've got all these extra trophic linkages. So what we did to test this was we did a caging study, but we built the cages out of different kinds of material. So here we have a, a, a two-sided control cage. We have just an open tray of oysters. We have one with this really small mesh to try to exclude everything. And then we have these cages with this larger mesh on it to exclude um, you know, these bigger predator, predators, but to let these meso or these intermediate predators in. And to sort of make that point, you know, your, your top predators should be excluded by the large mesh. All the predators should be excluded by the medium mesh. And then, of course, the controls are open to, to everything. So we put these cages out um, in uh, Corpus Christi Bay and in Aransas Bay and um, left them out from uh, August until October. Um, and after that time, we used a throw trap and we went out. Um, and if you're not familiar with this, you just, we place it over the tray. We pick up the tray and take it out of the water and then use a big net that's pictured here to sweep through that cage again and again and again until we catch everything. Okay? Um, this is really fun to do for about an hour and then it gets to be work, okay? Um, as I'm sure a lot of you know. So what we found was that there are a lot of different kinds of things on the oyster reefs, and I've, I've just given you a pie chart here. Most of what we caught here were mud crabs, okay? And um, I'm not gonna go into all the different species that we caught, but what we found that was really interesting was, um, this is the Atlantic mud crab, Panopheus hirschii. Um, in that large mesh treatment, we caught a lot of them. And in the small mesh treatment, we didn't, probably because they couldn't get in there because the mesh was there. 
We also didn't see a lot of them in the controls. And so presumably then, those blue crabs and those big fish are either eating those crabs in the controls or they're present there and those mud crabs don't come into the controls because they're scared of them. Okay? If you look at oyster survival though, we saw a lot of oyster survival in the small mesh cage when they're totally protected from predators. We didn't see differences in oyster survival between the control and the large mesh treatment. And we think that's because the mud crabs are eating them here and the blue crabs and the sheep's head and these other things are eating them there. Okay? So life is hard as an oyster, right? Because a lot of things are gonna, gonna eat you, which I understand because I like oysters too. So again, to, to say these, these predators here are also consuming these oysters. And so there are trophic relation, relationships on the reef and those trophic relationships are important, but it's not this clean cut kind of trophic cascade like you might think of. Um, but I would argue that these sort of um, large predators are probably more beneficial to oysters even though they eat them because they're transient and because they're not there all the time, right? So even though this blue crab is gonna eat this oyster, from the earlier study I showed you that if the blue crab's only there one day a week, the oyster isn't inducing a response to it, right? The mud crab though, that lives there all the time is gonna induce this response that presumably is gonna alter their growth and change their fecundity. So even though a lot of predators eat oysters, I think mud crabs are probably worse for oysters than blue crabs and other things are. Okay? Um, so trophic relationships are important um, and they do change uh, when top predators are excluded. Now, the idea when top predators are excluded is that you get something called mesopredator release. And so, and this, this is a nice review on this, but you guys are probably familiar with this study because Sean Powers was one of the co-authors, but um, when, when sharks are removed, um, stingrays proliferate, um, they overconsume the scallops and the fishery crashes, okay? Um, uh, there, I mean, there's just tons and tons of examples of, of mesopredator release. I mean, you guys are probably all familiar with the otter, urchin, kelp story from the Pacific Northwest, right, where um, otters eat urchins, urchins eat kelp, and when otters are removed, urchins proliferate and they eat all the kelp. And, and we tend to think of um, mesopredator release altering these trophic interactions um, when those top predators are removed, either through harvesting or habitat destruction or disease or something like that. Um, but what we're finding is that sometimes you can have environmental conditions that interfere with foraging of top predators, and you can get this same sort of phenomenon occurring. And so Jessica's graduate work was simply, uh, or not simply, was about turbidity, okay? And turbidity, even as low as, as 20 uh, MTU, um, can interfere with the foraging ability of visual predators. And most of the, of the predators on oyster reefs, the top predators are fish, okay? And these fish forage using, of course, visual cues. And so Texas Parks and Wildlife, as part of their fisheries independent surveys, they go out and they do trawls and gill nets and bag seines. And this is where they, they set their catch limits for fisheries. And so we went through this data set. And in general, what we found is that um, when turbidity was, was low, and we're defining low as below 30 MTU because we know 30 is an important cutoff for fish. So when turbidity is below 30 MTU, um, fish abundance is significantly greater than when turbidity is above that threshold. And then crabs show the opposite pattern, okay? So when it's turbid, you get more fish. I'm sorry, when it's turbid, you get less fish, you get more crabs, okay? Um, I'm not gonna talk about all of the diversity studies today. Um, hopefully we'll be able to get this published in the next few months, but um, in general, if you go through this data set, species richness is always higher when the water is clear. And what we think happens and, and I'm gonna show you some data on this in just a second, is that the fish abundance goes down, the fish ability to forage goes down, the crabs proliferate, overall predation rates go up and they eat all the rare stuff. And that's what's driving this pattern. But to do a sort of an empirical study on oyster reefs for a better survey, we went to uh, Rockport, Texas, which is right here in St. This is Rockport, right there. This is our field site in St. Charles Bay. It's a state park. There are natural oyster reefs here that aren't harvested. 
and we spent most of the summer putting out hydrolabs and finding areas that were routinely turbid or routinely not. Okay. Now, our system, turbidity, is driven by suspended sediments, and so when it's windy, the water is turbid, and when it's not windy, the water is clear. So all the sites can be clear or all the sites can be turbid. But in general, the highly turbid sites are above 30 MTU. Actually, they're above 45 MTU most of the time. And the clear ones are below 20 most of the time. And they're sort of staggered around these different oyster reefs. And what really drives this pattern is like in this highly turbid reef here, there's a, a big mud flat behind it. And so there's more sediment. And then these low turbid reefs, there's seagrasses and other things here. And so they don't get exposed to all these suspended sediments, at least not as long. So doing a similar study using trays and throw traps as we did before, we put out these oyster trays on reefs that were turbid or not. We left them out there all summer. We went back, we used the throw traps, and we collected um, what we could off these reefs. And sort of to coincide with um, the parks and wildlife data and mimicking the study we did with predator exclusion, when water was turbid, we got significantly more mud crabs uh, in the highly turbid sites. And we assume this is because of a reduction in fish predation. We also put out um, larval oysters that we had settled on the shelves, again, got from Scott, and um, put these uh, in our field sites. Um, we didn't see differences in oyster predation, which isn't surprising because remember we saw um, before in the caging study that whether you're exposed to, to sheep's head or blue crabs, something's going to eat you. What we did see though was a big change in oyster shell morphology. So in the turbid environments where they had more mud crabs, they're changing their shell morphology and probably lowering their fecundity. So not only do predators play an important role in oyster reefs, but turbidity can change the predator field and alter the trophic interaction that cascades down and alters oyster growth. So we did some tethering experiments um, to, to see if we could measure changes in predation on mud crabs. And quite simply, we're just super gluing a, a crab to one of these staples and putting these in the field in groups of five on reefs that are turbid or reefs that are not. And, and what's really good about um, doing tethering experiments with mud crabs, um, there's a lot of stuff that's bad about doing this. Not only experimental artifacts, but fingers getting pinched and lots of cursing. Um, but the, um, when, when mud crabs are eaten by other crabs, they tend to leave the carapace behind on the tether. When they're eaten by fish, they don't. So not only can you figure out the level of predation, you can figure out what predator is causing the predation. We expected to see more predation on crabs in the low turbidity, but we didn't. We saw more predation in the high turbid sites, probably because there's a lot of crabs there, and these crabs tended to like um, these mud crabs. But what we did see was that the carapaces that are left behind were almost always left in the turbid sites. And so we know that predation in those conditions is done by crabs, and most of the predation in the low turbid sites is done by fish. Okay? So we really think that turbidity is driving this, um, this pattern of fish predation. Um, it's changing the predator field and then um, the changing oyster growth. And so based on the analysis we've done in these long-term data sets and the sampling, what, what, what the working hypothesis is is that when the water's clear, um, these visual predators dominate. They're really, really successful. When turbidity gets cloudy, they leave and go somewhere else because they can't see to forage very well. And the ones that stay don't forage very well because they don't see that well. Um, chemosensory predators then proliferate because these guys aren't you know, feeding on them anymore. They're not there to scare them and alter their foraging behavior. They forage using chemoreception, so they're not impacted by turbidity. And then they overconsume things driving biodiversity down as turbidity goes up. Okay. Um, I did, I'm not going to show it today. We've done some mesocosm work with this where we've made mesocosms turbid or not and looked at foraging relationships. Um, and exactly as you would predict, um, fish foraging tends to decline in high turbidity and crab foraging. Um, basically, blue crabs eat everything if you put them in a tank, right? The shrimp or mud crabs or anything else. So. A couple things. So we know that hue concentration is really important um, in driving these patterns. And so, um, you know, in situations where you have longer term exposure, when you have more predators in the field due to meso predator release, that that alters oyster morphology and affects their growth. And again, we know that along these lines, that hue duration is really important as well, right? And so that the more 
uh, exposure you get to Q, the more responses you get. And we also know that Q type is important. So hopefully at this point of the talk, I've convinced you that predator-prey interactions on oyster reefs are important, that they drive the food web, that turbidity is important, um, that chemical cues are important on oyster reefs. But I want to completely switch gears and show you a study that we've done that talks about or discusses how um, chemical cues can affect oyster settlement and growth. So we're going to move away from predator cues and talk about settlement. So oysters uh, are broadcast spawners. They have a, a planktonic larval life stage. After, you know, 3 to 10, 12, 13, 14 days or so, um, they, they pick a hard substrate on, they settle, they attach to that substrate, they secrete the shell and begin to grow. Okay. Um, oysters will move down in the water column and, and use their foot and move around a little bit. And if they don't like the substrate they're on, they'll lift back up into the water and they'll float around until they find something that they like better. I would argue that because this location that oysters choosing is forever, that that's probably the most important decision an oyster will ever make. And yet we don't know a whole lot about what causes them to pick certain habitats. I mean, we know some, salinity has got to be right, and food and, and substrate in this thing. Um, but we don't understand a lot about sort of the chemical cues that, that are involved with the choice. Now, if I told you that habitats with greater biodiversity were important and they tended to be more stable um, and tend to be more productive, and, that, and you wouldn't be surprised because biodiversity is a fundamental goal of, con of conservation and has been for a long time, and rightfully so. Um, but some recent work has shown that habitats that tend to be more diverse and tend to be healthier, they smell better. Okay, So some work by um, Mark Hay and Daniel Dixon at Georgia Tech where they compare coral reefs in a marine protected area versus in an adjacent area that's not protected. If you take water off those two areas and you offer it to fish or crabs or corals or anything that grows there, they'll choose BMPA water because it smells better to them. Okay, So we know that diverse habitats are attractive to other things. This is probably why MPAs don't have this big spillover effect that you think that they should, because if fish or something get out of the MPA, it doesn't smell good to them, so they go back to the MPA. So, so keep that, that thought in mind as I tell you this. We know that biodiversity of, or species diversity is important. What's becoming more and more recognized is that within species diversity, things like genetic diversity can also be really, really important and they can be important in ecological time. And, and when I give this talk, I, I like to show this picture because, well, I, I like dogs, first of all. Um, but also because I think it really draws home the point that even though something is the same species, it can be quite different, right? And so having diversity within one species can sometimes mimic the effects of species diversity, especially if that's a foundation species. Now, when I talk about genetic diversity, you're probably thinking about something about natural selection over time, right? So if you've got a lot of genetic diversity in an insect population, they evolve more quickly to, to pesticides and you know, bacteria evolve more quickly to antibiotics. There's genetic diversity. And this is all true, but I'm not talking about evolutionary time. I'm talking about within one generation, you can see effects of genetic diversity. So for example, in seagrass beds, if you increase the genetic diversity of eelgrass, okay, this is all the same species, all, all, all zostra, um, all the same species. If you increase genetic diversity, those seagrasses tend to have more fauna. Okay, So those secondary faunal associated species are more abundant. They tend to be more resistant to disturbances like heat stress and grazing, and they tend to recover faster after those disturbances. Okay, So you get a lot of these big effects in the community due gene to genetic diversity that you would normally associate with species diversity in other systems. And this has been shown in many species. In aspen trees, for example, um, genetic diversity in aspen forest um, leads to a greater diversity in insect community, which leads to greater diversity in birds. Okay, it's been shown in goldenrod and all, all kinds of stuff. There's been um, almost no work that's been done on this with animals. Okay? Um, and especially none that's been done with animals that are sort of important ecosystem engineers like oysters. Now, given that oysters are 
if they're not the most degraded marine habitat, there's certainly one of them. About 85% of them are gone. And there's huge interest in, in preserving the ones that are left and restoring them, and we want to make those effective. We need to understand something about this. And if losing this intraspecific diversity is, is causing oyster reefs to be unhealthy in some way, this could hinder these kinds of efforts. So we did a study where um, we looked to see if chemical cues from adult oysters would affect oyster settlement in the field. And if we could increase diversity in oysters, how would that affect oyster settlement? So using these trays that I showed you before, we just put a crossbar on here. Um, we started using oyster shells and then drilling these was kind of a pain in the butt. So we figured out we could get these kind of rough grooved um, PVC um, spat sticks and use those instead to standardize settlement area and then mount these on this crossbar. So we're going to put our treatments on the tray. We're going to put something up here for, for oysters and the plankton to settle on so they can judge a chemical signature from the tray and then land on a standardized surface for area and texture. So differences we see should be due to chemical cues from the tray. So the first study we did was we took these trays and we put them in the field in pairs. And in one member of the pair, we just put um, 20 liters of oyster shell. and the other member of the pair, um, we put uh, a, a 20 liters of living oysters. We either embedded these in natural oyster reefs or we put them about five to 800 meters away from natural oyster reefs, which is about as far away as we could get from natural reefs in our field site. And we did this because we thought maybe if you were far away from an oyster reef that we would see a difference between our treatments, but in an oyster reef there might be enough ambient hue that it would just sort of mask the, the signal from our treatments. But if you look at the mean number of recruitment, it didn't really matter whether they were near reefs or far, the living oysters always got significantly more settlement than those with shells. And so that suggested to us then that there's a chemical cue that comes off those living oysters that causes settlement to occur. And this isn't like the most shocking finding. People have done this in the lab before. Okay? I mean, it was the first one to do it in the field. Um, and, and I thought it was pretty surprising that sort of this near and far angle. So with that in mind, we decided to manipulate diversity. And, and in Texas, um, our, our bays are, we have this lagoonal system, we have low water exchange in the bays, and so the, sort of the idea was that an oyster, you know, in, in Coconut Bay, for example, the, the residence time in that bay is a year, okay? In San Antonio Bay, it's 80 days, okay? So this far exceeds the two weeks that oysters are in the plankton. So we didn't figure a lot of oysters were getting between bays. So we collected oysters from Caronqua Bay up here, from Matagorda Bay, from San Antonio Bay. And we brought them down to St. Charles Bay and, and put them in our field site. Um, we didn't have enough money to do reciprocal transplants against all sites. Okay? And so what we ended up doing was um, choosing a, a site that none of the oysters came from. Does that make sense? Because we didn't want to bias it by if they liked, in other words, if oysters from San Antonio Bay liked oysters from San Antonio Bay, we could bias the study by putting it in San Antonio Bay. So we put it in St. Charles Bay not to have that. And we put them in the field in a block design. So you had 60 oysters from Caronqua Bay, 60 from Matagorda, 60 from San Antonio, and then 20 from each in a mixed treatment. Um, we put this out in 2007. We had a big flood, and everything died. We put this out in 2008. I forgot. I just, I don't, I'm so embarrassed to even tell you I did something totally careless. We lost this. The results were no good. I put it out in 2009. We lost it in a storm. Okay, um, it's like a Monty Python thing here, but the tenth, you know. Um, but the uh, the fourth time we put it out in 2010, we got this pattern. So we had significantly more oyster recruitment in this mixed treatment than we did in any of the of the single bay treatments. Now, I want you to pay attention to this axis because in 2010, Texas was in the height of a drought, and salinity in our field site was about 40. And the oysters were really stressed. There wasn't a whole lot of recruitment going on. So because we had had so much bad luck with this experiment, and because genetic diversity often manifests itself when conditions are really stressful, we thought it best to repeat this experiment. And we got lucky because in 2011, 
even though we were still in a drought, we had a bunch of rain in January and February. The salinity got a lot better. It was down to about 20, 22 um, when we put our experiment out. So first, notice the y-axis. So we got an order of magnitude more recruitment. And yet, we still see the pattern of mixed treatments getting more settlement. So we know that that diverse treatment seems to work, and it seems to work across a range of conditions. Well, we thought this was ready to publish, um, but a couple of the viewers were not so sure. And they suggested that, well, um, how do you know that, that the oysters don't prefer something like them? You know, what if you, what if you put oysters from your local system in the treatment? So in 2012, we went back out, except we got oysters from the local study system and included that in one of the treatments. Um, due to the drought, all of the oysters in Toronto Bay died. We weren't able to include that as a treatment. So I've replaced Toronto Bay with these oysters from the local system. But once again, significant more recruitment in the mixed treatment and sort of the local oysters, presumably where this um, larval oysters are coming from, didn't show a preference for that. So it's definitely something in this mixed treatment that's causing these, these um, larval oysters you know, to prefer that treatment and to have more recruitment. So just a couple of things. Um, we know that living oysters attract more spath and shelves. Um, we know that mixtures attract more um, oyster spath than, uh, and larval oysters than single source mixtures. And I think this has some implications for reef restoration. I mean, I know people have tried dressing reefs with, with oyster spat. I know living oysters have often been used. Um, and sometimes that doesn't work because you put out a bunch of loose oysters. Um, you know, it, it's just sort of a feeding frenzy for predators. Um, but I do think that this knowledge could sort of maybe help enhance reef restoration in some areas, maybe by putting out living oysters, caging them in some way, and using their chemical cues um, to attract oyster larvae. I think what's both good and bad about this study um, is that it suggests that exploited populations, especially of oysters, could be in more trouble than we realize. Because we don't manage for genetic diversity, we manage for numbers, right? And so they're going along fine because they've got plenty of numbers, but, but through all this harvesting pressure, they're losing diversity, they're losing diversity, they're losing diversity, and then they crash because that diversity is gone. But the flip side of that is, if we understand this and we sort of plan harvesting and we manage accordingly and we think about genetic diversity, we manage for that, maybe then um, we can make some headway and make restoration more successful. So I'll just go back to the slide. I've shown you a lot of different things today. I hope it um, hasn't been too boring for you. Um, but I think we're starting to get a handle on how some of these different things like genetic diversity affects recruitment. and and how that may affect um, functioning on the reef and some interactions between things like um, turbidity predation and, and predator field. So I'm going to stop talking, uh, except to say I need to thank um, a couple of uh, uh, Chris Marshall and, and John Grabowski have helped us with this, people in the lab, all sorts of different um, funding opportunities uh, and sources and, and things. And I'll, I'll be happy to try to take any questions. Thank you very much for coming and for the invitation.